I'm Anitra Carol Smith. I'm a screenwriter and I'm writing a movie called Silent Sparrow about the story of Mary Sue Green, a story like no other that I have heard. And uh, tell us a little about where you were born and where you grew up. Well, my name is Mary Sue Green and I was born in a little town in Georgia, Louisville, Georgia, actually where they still have the slave market in the middle of town. Mm -hmm. And I now live in Ojai, California. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I ever heard about Mary Sue, or heard about you, was that your mom had given you away when you were 10 years old. And I thought, how could that be? How is that possible? And then what happened to her next? It made me really curious about your life. And eventually uh, you asked me to write your life story. And we started at the beginning and I found out all the background. Tell us a little about your mom and your biological dad. Well, my story is one that is uh, quite unusual. <coughs> uh, usually children are given away when they're very young even as babies or when they're young children. I was born in a home with a white mother, Caucasian mother, and a black father. Uh, my father was not in the home, of course, because I was born out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. uh, the man that I thought was my father was a white man. Um, and I was hidden away, actually hidden away, for all those years. I never attended school. Um, I lived most of my life in the forest, as a matter of fact, on mm -hmm. my own. My mother gave me away, and I, at the time, I thought it was very cool. But now, as an adult, uh, and I've experienced a lot, I actually should thank her if mm -hmm. she were still living, mm -hmm. because that's the only way that I had an opportunity to be able to get out into the world and make something of myself. Tell us about the day that you were given away. There was a stranger who came to the house. Who was she? Well, there was a stranger who came to the house. Uh, she was no stranger, I guess, to my mother, but to me she was. Uh, she was from the welfare department, mm -hmm. and her name was <coughs> Mrs. Wynn. She came, she had been there before a few times to bring bags of clothing, used clothing, that, uh, because all of my clothes actually were made from uh, flower sacks. Flower sacks. <laughs> yes. Long time ago, they yeah. made flour. You could get flour mm -hmm. in five, ten, twenty-five pound bags, mm -hmm. and the bags had floral patterns. Mm -hmm. And my mother, at the time, was a seamstress, and all of my clothes were made from that. I had no shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Miss, anyway, Mrs. Wynn had come to the house that morning, and she brought a bag of clothes, and. Um, she had brought the clothes a few days before. Mm -hmm. And then on this particular day, three or four days after that, she came back. And I wondered why, because I never heard them talking when she came. Mm -hmm. And this particular day, she came back. But my mother had gotten up early that morning mm -hmm. and gotten the old ironing board and an old iron that she had heating in the fireplace. Mm -hmm. And she had ironed a little dress that Mrs. Wynn had brought. And she put it on me, and I thought I was very cute because I didn't have clothes. <laughs> it was your first dress other than flower it sacks. It was my first right. real dress. <clears throat> she put it on. It was a cute little dress, a little white dress with a uh, sash in the back and mm -hmm. ruffles. She put it on me, and I had shoes. Uh -huh. And when Mrs. When Mrs. Wynn came, um, my mother took me to the door with Mrs. Wynn, and Mrs. Wynn told me she was taking me to live with people like myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand what she meant at the time, but I did get in the car, and the last time I saw my real mother, I looked out the back window of the car and waved at her, mm -hmm. and she was standing in the doorway. She never said anything. She didn't say goodbye. She didn't hug me, and that's the last time I saw her. Oh. There's an interesting backstory to this, too, that you wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the grandmother of the actor, Danny Glover. Because your mom was panicked, from what I can tell, when she discovered she was pregnant. Because Johnny Brown, the neighbor, was quite a charmer. 
<laughs> he could talk the fuzz off a peach. That's what the cousins <laughs> said to me. So she wanted to get an abortion. And she went to the, the Johnny to Danny Glover's grandmother, and she said, "I'm a good Christian woman. I'm not going to do it." And so, you owe your life really to her. I really do. Yeah, I do owe my life to yeah. her. Uh, she was a midwife. Mm -hmm. They called them that. And when my mother went to her, she said, "I bring life into the world. I will not take a life." Yeah. So, actually, at that moment. You know, I could have no longer existed sure. had she decided to go ahead with the abortion, but she didn't. And so, of course, my mom had no other choice but to carry me. And I was born to her. I remember you were born in a snowstorm on January 19th? January 21st. 21st, 1942. Yes. And the midwife came through the snow to the little cabin in the woods. And when you were born, she looked at you and said, I did the right thing. Yes. Beautiful That's what little I baby. Yes. Yeah. You were chubby and healthy and beautiful. And she said, That was the right thing for me to do. And I would have loved to have had a picture. I've never seen myself when I was small, young. Uh huh. The first picture I saw, I was about 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what I looked like as I was small. But yes, I did. I, Mm -hmm. I did grow up with her, and I, I had a rough life. When, in some of your earliest memories, when you were just a toddler, you, you've told me that you actually walked off in the woods by yourself, and your family let you do that. What did you do when you got out there in the woods? <clears throat> actually, starting as, as young, as far back as I can remember, I would wander in the woods, mm -hmm. and uh, that, was my, that was my basically my home. Mm -hmm. I lived most of my life in, in the woods, not at night, of course, but in the daytime. I spent most of my time in the woods. Um, I loved the trees. I loved the flowers. Um, but weren't there rattlers out there and cottonmouths? Oh, yes. There were creeks, as a matter of fact. There was a creek not too far from the home. Uh huh. And um, how I survived without a snake bite, only God knows. Yeah. Uh, because I did spend a lot of time in the woods and around old stumps and old trees that had fallen on. I even, I'm sure I was a little bit older, but I even crossed the creek on old trees that had fallen down across the creek. Uh -huh. So Mary Sue, tell us about the time that the tree tricked you in the forest. <laughs> I climbed trees all the time. I loved climbing trees. And the, with the large trees, I would climb them up on them and get on the branches and just sit and look out into the forest. But this particular day, and I had been doing this, climbing up the smaller little saplings. And so this day, I would go, go up to the top and I would catch the top of the tree and I would swing the tree over and it would bring me back down to the ground. Right. But this particular day, I went up and I guess I thought I was a big girl. So I climbed the sapling, went to the top and swung out and I came halfway down and the tree was too big. It would not bend anymore. So I hung there as long as I could <laughs> and eventually I had to drop to the ground. You couldn't even go back up, couldn't right? Get back you tried up. to kick your feet up, down. nothing not happened. Yeah. So I had to drop to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> you made kind of a world for yourself in the forest, it seems like. You made a little I kitchen did. and tell me about what you did out there in the forest all alone every day. Every day. Well, I <coughs> talked a lot. That's when I did most of my talking. I talked to the trees, I talked to the flowers, I talked mm -hmm. to whatever I could. Yeah. But yes, I played around the stumps of the big oak trees. Uh, I had little pieces of whatever I could find, broken brick, mm -hmm. uh, rock, mm -hmm. and I used them as little cars, and I had garages, and I, I had a whole little thing. And then I had a kitchen mm -hmm. that I had old boards that I'd made shelves, and mm -hmm. I would get the weeds and whatever and make meals, little uh, <laughs> cakes made out of mud and yeah. water. Uh, I just, I did whatever I could out in the mm -hmm. forest to keep myself occupied. And I would hide and I loved getting around the trees that had fallen down from the mm -hmm. wind and whatever. And sometimes I, that was my little, little place I could go and Your like, world, my yeah. world. I would hide in between <coughs> them. And if I was afraid, if anything happened at the house, at my home, mm -hmm. uh, 
that's where I would go. And there were hours that I would sit out there. I know that you always went to the forest when something bad happened, like your brother-in-law abused you, which he did for years. Then tell me what you would do when you went to the forest for comfort. You said the forest was like a mother to you. That's who I could talk with. Mm -hmm. I would cry. Mm -hmm. and I would wonder why I was different mm -hmm. and why I was treated the way I was. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my home. That was my, that was my home, away from home, my forest. My forest was my, uh, that's what kept me going. That's one of the things that interested me about your story because I think it's so unusual for a child to have no one at their back, only the forest as a mother. And whenever something happened, you went to the forest for comfort. Even when you were home, no, it sounds like nobody talked to you. You were silent. And they talked over you at the table, for example. I remember the time you had chicken pox. And poor little thing, you, you were covered with these oozing sores. No one told you what was going on. For all you knew, you were dying. And they just let you go out in the forest, right? That's all I could do. Yeah. And you didn't know what was happening no, to you. I didn't. I didn't yeah. know what it was. Yeah. Uh, one of the most amazing things we found out was why the social worker showed up and took you away. And 50 years after the fact, remember, the cousins told us that some courageous black family had gone to the county and said, there is a little black girl in our neighborhood who never goes to school. She's 10 years old and she can't read or write. And that's why the social worker showed up. That was very risky, right, in those times, to well, speak up. It was. Yeah. And my mother had tried to go to the white school, I understand. Yes. And of course, they would not take me. Right. And she was too embarrassed to go to the black school. Yep. So I never went to school. And I did have a sister who was a few years older than mm -hmm. I. And the school bus would come and pick her up. And mm. of course, I was just, it was awful because the mm -hmm. kids on the bus called me everything. Yeah. yeah. They, they and I would hide under the house because mm. along in that time down south, the houses mm. were built up on uh, brick pillows mm -hmm. and you could crawl underneath. Mm. And I spent a lot of time under the house too. So Even though people told you there were dangerous snakes under there. That's right. I still stayed under you there. You still went under there. I went under the house. I was <laughs> safer there. <laughs> I know you did. Um, the way that I got connected to the filmmaker that we're working with, the director, is so unusual. I want to mention that. I sold my car, and you know most of the story, and uh, I put my other car, I was getting ready to sell it on Auto Trader. I called the 800 number. A very wonderful, rich, southern voice answered. And he said, um, you know, can I help you? And, and he said he was in Atlanta. And I said, oh, you're in, a, you're in Georgia? I've been all over Georgia as part of a book project. So this is a guy working at Auto Trader. And uh, I said, oh, and he said, what was, what was the book? And I gave him the 30 second summary of your mm -hmm. life story. And he got very quiet. And then he said, I think you need to know that I'm Lee Coleman and I work for Auto Trader during the day, but at night and all weekend, I'm an assistant director at Pinewood Film Studios in Atlanta. I'm very interested in your story. I want to give you my email, and we need to talk. Well, I don't know who sent him along, but uh, yeah, I guess that's that's something that is uh, my story is one that I think needs to get out mm -hmm. somehow because mm -hmm. I know there are lots of people. I do believe that there are young girls mm -hmm. who may not have gone through some of the same things that I did, because I, I went through every kind of abuse you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are people who, sometimes, you know, when you have things like that that happen to you, you feel that you're the only one. And, mm -hmm. and I know when I was young, I had nobody to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to bear it all myself. Mm -hmm. and, but I remember saying that one day things would be better for me. Mm -hmm. You used to get on your knees and say I that. I did. I didn't mm -hmm. know anything about God. I didn't know anything about church. Mm -hmm. But there was something that drew me to that. Mm -hmm. That I guess it was a form of prayer. Mm -hmm. 
and I knew that one day my life would be better. And there are people who need to hear some of the things that happen and know that there is a better tomorrow. But you have to be strong and you have to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And you have, have to keep knowing that, um, <coughs> you know, there are some, there are good people. Mm -hmm. And just because those things happened to me in my own home and I had no, I could not do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I knew that things would, would be better. And I would like to say a little bit about uh, my adoption. Sure. Uh, the way I was adopted, since I was 10 years old, mm -hmm. when you're young, usually you're, you know, they take you in a family, they, they give you to a family. Mm -hmm. But since I was 10, the welfare decided <coughs> to let me choose my own parents. Mm -hmm. And the way they did that, they would come, I was in foster care at that time and they would come to the foster care on like a Friday afternoon and get me and I would go and stay in a home the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I did that for four or five different times and I saw different families and different mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that really, that I look back at now and I wonder how did I, as a child, that, that age, mm -hmm. make that decision? Because the families were ordinary families but one of the families happened to have been a very wealthy family. And uh, they had you know, maids and everything, which I had never experienced. I had never had money or clothing or mm -hmm. good food or anything. Mm -hmm. So you would think that would have been the thing that made me make up my mind to choose that family. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. Mm -hmm. There was something missing. Mm -hmm. I could feel it. I didn't know at the time what it was, mm -hmm. but I knew something was missing. Mm -hmm. And so a few weeks later, they came again and told me there was another family who would like for me to come. And I went to this particular family. And we met at a park. That's how they, we made the exchange. And we met at the park. And as soon as I saw this woman and man, mm -hmm. I knew that was my parents. Mm. And I don't want to cry, but I'm about to cry. <laughs> what were you feeling that made you know it was your it was your true parents? It was love. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, and I felt it. Uh huh. Yeah, it still chokes me up. <laughs> me too. But when I saw that, and I saw the way they were with each other, and mm -hmm. how they were with me, mm -hmm. I know I knew that that was the parents that had been chosen for me. I remember that you never spoke much anywhere. You were so withdrawn. And when you said a few words in your tiny little voice, Daddy Morgan said, your, your voice is so tiny. It sounds like a kitten. I'm going to call you kitten. That's my nickname. Yeah. Kitten. He yeah. called me that. That's all he ever called me. Yeah. He's kitten. Yeah. That was a great moment. And it, it was another coincidence that should never have happened. So many coincidences have come together for you, for your life, because Mama Morgan heard about you from like a hundred miles away through a friend that there was this girl now about 11 years old that was up for adoption. She had lost two sons and she said, I'm too old to start over with a baby, but if I could only find an older girl who really needs a home and family, that would be wonderful. Well, she found it. Yeah. It, it, was, it, was a, it was a sort of a strange situation because I had a cousin who had gone to college with a girl from Louisville, Georgia, mm. and they became very good friends. And I was talking with my cousin one day, my adoptive cousin, and I was telling her about, you know, when I was young and being in Louisville, and she says, I have a very good friend in Louisville. I'm going to call her. And she did. And this particular friend had heard of my situation and how the little girl, they called me the little lost girl mm -hmm. because they didn't know what had happened to me. They had heard about this black girl who lived in a white family mm -hmm. and did not go to school. And all of a sudden, one day, I was gone and they didn't know what had happened to me. Yeah. And so she said, I know that family. And she, she called them and talked with actually my cousins, mm -hmm. my biological cousins. Mm -hmm. And we talked, and you and I mm -hmm. 
went to Georgia, went to Blissville, Georgia. Yep. And we met them. I had the privilege of being there when your cousin that you'd never known came running across the parking lot with her arms out, Cousin Maddie. And she said, Mary Sue, we've been waiting 50 years for you. Everybody in the family. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That was, that was really cool. It yeah. Was. And everywhere, everywhere we went, if you remember, mm -hmm. in the town, everybody says, oh, that's my cousin from across the street. Yep. Yeah. We were, I was accepted. I was afraid for so many years to make that connection because mm -hmm. I was afraid I would be rejected. Sure. And finally, when I did yeah. make that, it, it was just nothing but just, just sheer joy. Uh, Maddie said that the, the whole black community was watching you when you were living with your white family before you were given away. And she said, back in those years, we couldn't do anything. No. But we were, we were afraid for you because we knew you didn't go to school. And so then, as I said, some family took courage and called the county. And that's how everything changed in your and life. And I never found out who that was. No. But it was a black no. family who yeah. did call them and tell them that it was a little girl living in a situation and she could not go to school. And of course your dad it was a one of a kind. And he used to sell moonshine. <laughs> and when he found out that JD was pregnant with his child, he started a rumor that it was some other guy's <laughs> yes. child. And that poor guy had to gather up his <laughs> wife and children and leave town overnight. That's so sad. I know. I felt so bad I when know. I heard that. But that was many, many, many years ago. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he fled for his life because he didn't know what would happen to him. Sure. If that got out. Yeah. And of course, my, my biological dad, who was <laughs> Johnny he was Brown. something else. <laughs> well, the interesting thing to me too, Mary Sue, is you, you were very resourceful. You found a way to survive, and that's just like your, your biological dad. I mean, think about being a, a black man in Georgia in the 1940s, but he managed to work out a, an agreement with the white lawyer to sell moonshine, and he <laughs> practically ran the town, Johnny Brown did. <laughs> He'd go around with $1,000 in his coverall pockets. I know. He'd walk into the white bar on Saturday night and be served. I mean, that's phenomenal. I know, it is, yeah. it really is. But he didn't go to church. I asked the oh, cousins, no. I said, did Johnny ever go to church? And they all started laughing and they said, oh yeah, Johnny go to church. Well, he didn't go in the church. <laughs> He'd be in the parking lot with his trunk open, <laughs> selling moonshine. You know, so. Yeah, he was that a one-of-a-kind.